this morning as we uh, uh, embark on the Word of God and get the opportunity to remember what this weekend really represents and uh, this Memorial Day weekend where many will spend time with family and they'll spend time uh, together doing, uh, maybe it's at the lake or at a home, at a cookout, and yet it's so easy to forget that the opportunity that we even have to do those things was and is because men and women have sacrificed and given up their lives so we can have that freedom. I thank Bob and uh, his presentation and all those within our body here who have served faithfully and um, when you watch that video and you hear the stats of those who have gone before us and have given their lives, it, the verse that constantly comes through to me is the passage in John which says, no greater love has anyone ever known than this, that one would lay down his life for his friend. And Jesus would go on to say, and I call you my friends. It's a sacrificial type of love. Uh, as we move through the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verses 19 through chapter 4, verse 6, it hinges and it comes upon what we just studied last week, which was the concept of loving one another. And when we love one another as Christ has loved us, that is indicative of us and it qualifies you and me as being a child of God. And so we saw in verse 16 of chapter 3 last week, he says, by this we know love. And then he goes on to give us the example. How do we know what love really is? And he says, he, referring to Jesus, laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. He went on to say at the end of verse 18, Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Uh, don't just speak about it, but be about it. It's pretty much what he was saying. So he ends verse 18 with this concept of us loving by action. Indeed, and in truth, it, it embarks the concept that we love with action. We don't just say it, but we demonstrate that we have love for one another. And so we get our passage today, starting in verse 19. He just mentioned indeed and truth. Verse 19 starts, by this we shall know that we are of the truth. He explains to, it right, explains to us right here what it means to be of the truth. And not only that, he says, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. He's simply saying that your actions and my actions, they indicate that we belong to the Lord. He goes on to say that there's a time in our life that we may have a crisis of belief. Maybe you've been through a crisis of belief where something has happened to you in this life. This life has not been fair, and it has brought you to a time of a crisis of belief. And what he means in this verse 19 of that the truth and it reassures our heart before him, what it ultimately means is that even in those specific times where we have a crisis of belief, we can know that we are a child of God and we have a relationship with God as we look back on our lives, specifically in how we have treated and loved others. In the name of Jesus. He moves in verse 20 and says, For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Though we've been given the criteria here in this scripture that we've been studying in the book of 1 John of what it means to be a child of God, there are still moments, believe it or not, where you come to that conclusion of, man, I, I don't know necessarily if I've always measured up 
to what it is that I've been asked and commanded to do. Have you ever found yourself there? And you're reading through the Word of God and you're giving commands and you're giving uh, encouragement of how to live. And then there's moments in your lives where if you were honest and you do honest introspection of yourselves, you're, you come to that conclusion, well, I don't know if I'm really loving others as I've been commanded to love. That's the context that he's speaking of here. And even though that is healthy to have a conscience of I don't know if I'm loving others, God, as you've commanded me to love others, even though that's a healthy conscience, because here's the deal. If you are concerned about, am I loving others as Christ has called me to love others, and I don't know if I'm doing that as well as I should, then that in and of itself indicates that you belong to Christ. Because a person who doesn't believe in Christ and follow the teachings of Jesus, they're not going to care. If they're loving others in the way that Jesus has commanded us to love. So even though it's healthy to have a, an introspection of God, there's just times in my life that I, that I don't measure up, even though that's healthy. He says this, for whenever our heart condemns us, God is still greater than our heart and he knows everything. What is he saying? He's saying that we commit ourselves to the mercy of God. Each and every day. Yeah. He's also saying that our ultimate judgment, it comes from God. Our ultimate judgment doesn't come from man. Aren't you glad? Yes. Yeah. At the end of the day, my actions, the life in which I live, is going to be, and yours is going to be judged by God. So if I'm going to live this life, if you're going to live this life, as a child of God, the one that we need to make sure that we are pleasing and obedient to is Him. But so many times we live our life as if man dictates my eternity. No, our ultimate judgment comes from God, not from man. Paul, to the, to the church at Corinth, mentions it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 through 5. Paul was being questioned by, by, by some of the religious teachers of the day of who he was and his apostleship and why is it that, that you get to speak, Paul? And Paul responds to them in chapter 4 of, of 1 Corinthians, verse 3 through 5, this way. He says, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So Paul, at a time where he was being questioned of his authority to preach, said, hey, you don't have the right to judge me. God, in his timing, will do that. John, speaking to this, is, is bringing it to the attention of his believers. He's saying this. Whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Isn't it a blessing to know that God knows everything? At times, that could be a negative. He knows everything there is to know about me and you. And yet here we see that though he knows everything, we can be reassured that he is greater than our heart. And what John is saying to these believers and saying to us today is that God knows that even though his command is to be holy as I am holy, he knows as long as we're in this fleshly earth suit, there are going to be times when we don't always measure up. And it doesn't give us a right to not live the way he's taught us to live. But it's comforting to know that when I do fail, I have a God who knows that 
and loves me in spite of my failure. And that, my friends, should be good news to all of us. Amen. And one theologian in looking at this passage of Scripture said it this way, even when we are no longer capable of conscious faith in God, and tread on the dark valley of severe or even mental illness, this God will still hold us in his hand. It comes from 2 Timothy 2 and 19. You can write that down and look it up later. To know that no matter what I go through, God will still hold me and he'll still hold you. It's a promise in his hand. I've often told some of our players to, to take their thumb and to look at it and to tell themselves, to repeat out loud, I am thumbbody. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you and I need to realize that you and I are thumbbody to God through Christ. Nobody else has my thumbprint. Nobody else has your thumbprint. You can have identical twins. They can all look exactly alike. You may not be able to tell them apart, but they put that thumbprint down. It tells the difference. You and I are intricately made. Individually made for the purposes of God. So if you come here today and you're, you're questioning your worth, I'm here to tell you you are somebody because you have been created by God for his purposes he moves on in verse 21 he says beloved if our heart does not condemn us we have confidence before God it's the result that we get of not feeling guilty that we get to approach the Lord with confidence not only do we get to approach him in confidence when he returns if we are still here but we get to approach him with confidence when we come to him in prayer that I can go before God in confidence and knowing that, God, I don't have it all together. I'm just a nobody trying to tell anybody about somebody who can save everybody. And when I understand that and I understand my position, it gives me a confidence that I know that I can go before him and I can confess and agree with him when I've done wrong for my sin, knowing that he loves me and cares for me. And it's true of you as well. Verse uh, 22, what's the, what's the outcome of our obedience? It says, and whatever we ask, we receive from him. Because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. What is verse 22 not saying? It's not saying that God is some genie in a bottle. It's not saying that when it says that when we ask, he'll give it to us. It's not saying that we rub the bottle and get our three wishes. Like so many believe. Even those in pulpits teach. It's not meaning that. What it's meaning is when you look at the very end of it, what's the qualification? It says, and whatever we ask, we receive from him. Why? Because we keep his commandments. And we do what pleases him. See, when you and I are in a right relationship with the Lord and I'm in his word and with his help, I'm obeying his commandments. And when I'm in his word and I'm praying and, I, and I'm asking him to reveal himself to me and my lifestyle is a lifestyle that would be pleasing to him. Then that which is now on my heart to pray is that which in which God wants to see happen. Through you and through me. And it will be accomplished. Because God's word will not return void. So when I'm in him and I'm praying and I'm seeking the things of God, it ultimately makes sense that he's going to answer those things and give those things because they're things that will bring honor and glory to him. Because I hate to tell you, but you and I can be obedient. We can be faithful. We can pray for our loved one to be healed from a sickness, and yet they may never be healed. Does not mean that God is not faithful. Does not mean that, that you have some kind of hidden sin in your life that you've not confessed, and if you only do that, then God will heal. 
No, just like in Jesus' time, when there was someone who was in need of physical help, the disciples said, Jesus, who sinned, him or his family, him or his parents? And Jesus said, no, he is like this for my purposes. We don't always understand the purpose of God. But it doesn't make him less God. See, the outcome of our obedience is that when we pray in our mindset, then we know that he will respond accordingly. And it's not from selfish motives, but it's according to the things of God. Even Jesus himself, you can look it up in John 8 and 29. Jesus himself prays to God. And we see God the Father answer God the Son. Why? Because Jesus was pleasing unto the Father. I've said this before. Jesus going to the cross, his ultimate motive was to be pleasing and obedient to his Father. You and I are the byproduct. We get to be saved through what he did in his obedience. What did Jesus cry out on? On the cross. Father, forgive them. Why? For they know not what they even in the midst of that turmoil, he was praying for you and ultimately for me. Yes, contextually, those who were doing the physical acts to him and putting him on the cross, but ultimately, it's a cry for all of us. We see here in verse 23, the greatest commandment. He just said that we receive from him because we keep his commandments. Okay, well, what's the commandment, John? In verse 23, he says, and this is the commandment. That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. It's a title, Christ. He's the Messiah. He was the one who was to come and love one another just as he has commanded us. I, I believe we have a scripture that's known as the greatest command. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40, and other gospel accounts would say, We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and in some instances it says in strength. But we're also to what? Love our what? Neighbor as ourselves. It's the greatest commandment. It's basic Christianity. Love God, love others. And when my relationship with God is not where it needs to be, a lot of times my relationship with others is not where it needs to be. And when my relationship with others is not where it needs to be, usually my relationship with God is struggling as well. Why? That's how he created it. That is why it's here. And he's telling these believers that this is his commandment. Love him and love others. We see in verse 24, our position in Christ. It says, whoever keeps his commandments, so when we're being obedient to loving him and loving others, what's our position? It says, whoever keeps his commandment abides in God, remains in God. But it doesn't just stop. It's almost like a cheap infomercial. There's more, right? He says that, that his commandments abide in God and God in him. That not only do we remain in God, but God remains in you and remains in me. Do you understand the significance of that? That I don't go through this life on my own. You're not going through this life on your own. No matter what life is thrown at you, you are not alone. Praise the Lord. God and God in Him. And by this we know. Notice how many times he says that phrase, by this we know. You think he's trying to get a point across? This is how you know. And this we know what? That He abides in us. How do we know that God abides, He remains in you and me? Because He's given us a deposit, He's given us a seal, He's given us. Solid proof. How so? What does it say? He abides in us by the Spirit. He has given us. Ephesians, Paul to the church at Ephesus would mention it this way. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Talking about Jesus, Paul to the church at Ephesus says this. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth. What's the word of truth, Paul? goes on to say, the gospel of your salvation. The good news 
of your salvation. So when you and I have heard the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ, which resulted in our salvation, and we did something, we believed in him. In that moment, what happened for you? What happened for me, Paul? He says this, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. We were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus says, I will go, but I will send you a what? Anybody know? A helper. Someone who will come along beside you. It's parakletos in the Greek. One who comes alongside of. He was promised. He's not just some ghost. It's not Casper right here. The Holy Spirit is a person. Don't miss that. The promised Holy Spirit who is the what? The guarantee of what? Our inheritance. Until when? Until we acquire possession of it. To the praise of his glory. The word guarantee literally means a down payment. God has given you and me a down payment. You ever put a down payment on something? Yeah. You put that down payment because the ultimate reason for that down payment is that that's yours, but maybe I can't really necessarily fully experience it yet. But here's the down payment. The down payment does what? It holds it for you. Right? Guarantee here, it says here that the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. He's, been, he's our down payment. And then when it says we acquire possession of it, what that literally means in the Greek is until God redeems his possession. So if you ever question, the devil ever causes you to have a crisis of belief, know this. The fact that you and I have the Holy Spirit living within us is truth that we are his children. You and I have been given a down payment until God redeems us ultimately when we get to heaven. There's not a need once we get to heaven to have the Holy Spirit living within us. Why? Because we will be changed and we'll be in the presence of God and we won't blow up. <laughs> Amen? That is what he has done on our behalf and, and John is trying to help them see that when you and I obey the commandments of loving the Lord our God with our hearts and mind and strength and we love our neighbor as ourself and we believe in what he's done for us in his death, burial, and resurrection, you and I have been given a guarantee of the Holy Spirit. We're moving it into chapter 4. John, in just making this statement about the Holy Spirit, wants to make sure there's no confusion for his believers that he's writing to. He wants to make sure that they understand that uh, not all spirits are the same. He's just mentioned the Holy Spirit is your guarantee of salvation, but understand that there are other spirits out there. Were the people that John was writing to, were they having difficulty with religious leaders, per se, who were saying that, hey, this message is coming to you from the Spirit of God? They were. The Gnosticism belief back during this time was the idea that, that Jesus was not necessarily God, that God's spirit took on the body of Jesus, and at the point of Jesus on the cross, that spirit left, which totally denied the incarnation, which totally denied that Jesus is God. And they were being told that, well, the spirit of God. I can't tell you how many people I run into in life and say, well, the Spirit of God told me this. Are you sure, or is it just because you ate pizza last night? Like, like, we're, we're like are you sure it's from God? we got to be careful. So he gives them this, this, this concept of how to be careful. He says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but instead test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. There are individuals in pulpits today that are false prophets. You better bank on it and believe it. Wolves in sheep's clothing, as some would say. And the only way you and I are going to know the difference is, is what they're saying does it line up with the Word of God. And if it does not line up with the Word of God, then it is not 
truth. And therefore, it does not need to be followed. That's what John is trying to make sure doesn't happen to his believers. Well, how do we know the difference? He says in verse 2, by this, here we go again, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. You got to understand, contextually, John is writing to a group of believers who are being deceived by so-called believers who are telling them that Jesus was not necessarily God. And so he's writing specifically to them by saying, this is how you know to test that specific spirit. Does their message indicate that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God? And if the message does not, then that message is not of God. It's from a totally different spirit. In verse 3, he goes on to say, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This instead is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. We've mentioned this person, the Antichrist, and here it's specifically talking about the belief system of the Antichrist, which is in direct opposition to the word of God. And any message that is taught that is in direct opposition to the word of God comes in the same bent as that view of the Antichrist when he comes. Within that same spirit. Because you see, to deny God and Jesus as being one and the same, it aligns a person with that belief system of an Antichrist, which comes from the source of the devil, which would be in direct opposition to God. And let me give you a few examples. To the Jew, they would look at Jesus and say, He's Mary's son. He's a teacher. He had many disciples. A Jew would believe many of the historic facts about Jesus. For the Muslim, they would say Jesus is a prophet. He's a teacher. He's a miracle worker. He actually sits next to Allah at judgment. And when Jesus returns, they believe that he will return. But the Muslim believes when Jesus returns, he'll be Muslim. The Baha'i faith believes that Jesus is just a manifestation of God. He was a messenger of God, but not really God. Uh, those who would follow the Hindu faith would say that Jesus is a holy man. He was a teacher. And that he was a God. Not the God, but he was just a God. Buddhism would say that Jesus was an enlightened man. He was a teacher and a holy man. And what we pretty much struggle with today is what's called the New Age Movement. This is what they would say that they don't necessarily believe Jesus to be a singular God, a man who they believe him to be a man who completed a process of spiritual evolution over successive generations of reincarnation. He just continued to reincarnate. And as he reincarnated over generation, over generation, over generation, he spiritually evolved. Ultimately becoming an enlightened master. That's who they would say Jesus is. And these are just a few that would say this is their view of Jesus. Is that the Spirit of God? It is not. Are many people today being misled by these faiths? Yes. So the question that should be asked when speaking of these is, is your Jesus the real Jesus? Many people want to talk about Jesus, but is your Jesus the real Jesus? And friends, I'm here to tell you today that we need to be reminded through God's word who the real Jesus is. Do you know? Would you be able to defend the real Jesus from the false Jesuses out there? I hope that you are able to. Because as our world continues to keep moving and going, um, it amazes me that you look at that video that we watched and we see these men and women who fought to give their lives for us, to give us the freedom to speech, to be able to speak out. And then you got individuals who literally will speak out against what we did in some of these wars. 
I, I remember Bob recently told me a story about how an individual came to him and, and, and found out that he was in Vietnam and said, well, that was a wasteless war. The fact that that individual had the right to even speak that <laughs> came because people fought in Vietnam. That's right. You see how we live in a world and a society today that that which we know as the Bible says is right in most of our society at times is looked at as wrong? And the things of the Bible that would say are wrong, our society would say, no, that's right. right. That's the slope that you can easily slide on if you're not careful. And John, to these believers, is saying, you and I can know the truth. We can know the truth. In verse 4, he moves on and says, little children, you are from God. That's how we can know. We're from God. And not only are we from God, what's the promise? We have overcome them, the false teachers, the false truths. We have overcome them for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Yes, praise the, Lord. the Spirit of God who lives within you and lives within me is greater than the spirit of the devil who lives and dwells within this world. The world representing mankind united in opposition to God. Evil attitudes that characteristically describe people. Paul, in dealing with this same situation in Romans chapter 8, says it this way. Romans 8, 31 through 39. He says this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. Oh, how will he not also with him, talking about Jesus, graciously give us all things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it who can condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. Sorry, Muhammad, he's not at the right hand of Allah. He's at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us because he's our high priest. Verse 35 says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, relationships, employers, employees, the news, politics. any of that separate us from the love of God, Paul would say, it can not. He says in verse 36, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. That's how Paul looked at his life, that me doing what I'm doing means my life is on the line every moment. It's like believers in other countries who take the charge to present and preach the gospel, even if it means losing my life. We're not there yet as Americans, but my challenge to you is, if you and I were, would we be those that would be willing to lose our life for the kingdom of God? Verse 37, no, in all these things, we are more than what? Conquerors. It's the same concept that John is referring to when he talks about us being overcomers. He says that we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38, 39, he says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come. Anybody here afraid of the unknown? <laughs> None of that, nor powers, nor height, nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. John is trying to let the, his readers know, he's trying to let us know that it's time for us to live victorious lives 
Instead of living lives as believers as if we've been defeated. Spoiler alert. I've read the book. We win. We've already won. In Christ. So church, so family, let us live lives. Those who are watching online, let's live lives of victory. Instead of living our lives in defeat. He closes with this. He says, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. Simple. He's saying those of us that are of God, when we speak the things of God, those who are of God, they receive it. Those who are not of God, they're not going to receive it. So don't be surprised when you're sharing the truth of God's word, when you're taking a stand for the faith, that there may be those who are in opposition and they may not agree with what you have to say. Those who are of God will listen and receive it. Those who are not will oppose it. Right here, we know it's going to happen. But however, he says this, by this we know, there's that phrase again, the spirit of truth and the spirit of of error. I can't help but think on this memorial weekend as we celebrate and we, we remember those who have sacrificed their lives for us so we can have freedom. Ultimately knowing that Jesus sacrificed his life for us so that we could have freedom. It doesn't necessarily mean that freedom is free. There is a cost. There was a penalty for our freedom. Both as Americans and as Christians. Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt on August of 1941, they were on the battleship HMS Prince of Wales. And it was a meeting that they had to, uh, to sign and discuss the Atlantic Charter, which would ultimately detail uh, uh, the goals for America and Britain after the end of World War II. What would, that, what would the world look like? How are they going to work together, America and Britain? And in, in this process of having this meeting to, to sign the Atlantic Charter, Winston Churchill was given the opportunity to have a church service. And in that church service, he said, I want to have one song played. I'm going to read you the song that he wanted to be played. Onward, Christian soldiers. Marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe. Forward into battle, see his banners go. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body. We won in hope and doctrine, won in charity. Crowns and thorns may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus, we have Christ's own promise, and that cannot fail. Onward then, ye people, join our happy throng, blend with our with our and your voices in the triumph song. Glory, laud, and honor unto Christ the King. This through countless ages men and angels sing. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on we remember those who have given their lives for us to have this freedom. Let us not forget Jesus who has given his life for us. Let us not forget that to love Jesus means that we love others. Let us not forget today that our ability to love him and love others is because he's given us the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. Let us know the difference in having the Spirit of God from the Spirit of the world. And let us be not only his children, 
but realize that there is a war and he's asking us to be soldiers within it. Understanding and knowing that as we go into battle, the battle has already been won. And you and I today can celebrate that victory. Amen. As we close with our closing hymn today, whatever God needs to do in your life, I ask that you allow him to work and speak into your life. That you'll allow him to, 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 to nudge you in ways that you need to be nudged to follow him. If you're here and, and, and you've never really fully trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that as we sing this last song. I'll stay at church today as long as I need to, to make sure you know Christ. And at the same time, if you're here and you're, you've been with us, but you never joined, you want to become a member, we'd love to offer you that opportunity as well. But you allow the Lord to do his will as we sing. Please stand.